So we are back in John chapter 12. So we're going to be looking into the triumphal entry. Last week, uh, we were trying to get into um, some of the biblical parallels. So looking at the, the accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And what we found was John by far had the most unique version of this particular passage. I was about to say the Greek word people would know. Anyway, uh, people know the word pericope? I don't think so. I didn't before this one. Anyways, so John has the most unique one. He also has the shortest account. But the reason for this is, is basically looking into um, some of the underlying themes that's coming up with this particular account that John has. So in order to start us off, I kind of wanted to do the whole where, where is this passage in the Gospel of John? So what's going on? Uh, so as I was trying to explain a number of times, uh, John's Gospel ends up being kind of like this, where you have the central climax being here, um, midpoint climax is being here. So this is uh, the resurrection of Lazarus. And then uh, that's going to correspond to uh, crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Well, I should just put resurrection. Resurrection of Jesus. And then uh, this part over here is going kind to of be uh, witness of the disciples. The reason why I'm crowding the board is that there's a TV behind me. Okay. Uh, so the witness of the disciples, that's when you have the, the calling that um, Andrew and Philip and Nathaniel and, and Peter and the unnamed disciple who is John, of course. So that's all kind of there. And we're moving out from this. So we were at uh, the anointing from Bethany. And this is the death of Lazarus, crucifixion, the main events. And on this side, I accidentally, last time I was talking about this, I went a little bit of a step further than I should have and said that was the baptism of, uh, of Jesus. Well, the baptism of Jesus does connect to with the anointing insofar as it's talking about the lamb. However, more properly speaking, <laughs> which I don't know why I didn't think of at the time, is this is uh, the wedding feast of Cana. And we know that because, well, there's, there's a feast, there's a feast, uh, Jesus preparing for death. There's so many different symbols there for preparation of death. Um, if you don't remember that, well, maybe you have to look up the Bible survey I did two years ago. <laughs> but basically, uh, yeah, this is definitely looking to the crucifixion account. So when we're getting to the triumphal entry here, entry, it's going to connect to a few different things. So the thing that we looked at most recently, so this would be a few months ago, was uh, Jesus meeting opposition at the temple in Jerusalem. And that was happening on a very specific holy day in the Jewish calendar. Actually, I should probably call it more of a holiday because it even though there is some holy underpinning currents of it, it it's, was sort of more implemented as a civic holiday, but well after the fact. Um, anybody remember the Lord on Earth holiday they were celebrating? It's not one that we normally celebrate in the church. It's sort of a harvest. Uh... Opposite. <laughs> because uh, that was actually happening in the winter. So uh, right now with the triumphal entry, we're actually moving closer to harvest time. But 
back then? No, that was that was several months earlier in the winter. Hmm. A oh, uh, Jewish holiday in the winter. Jewish holiday in the winter. Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Yeah. So that's also known as the feast of dedication of the temple. So we're going to be getting into that a little bit with the triumphal entry because that comes up here. So when Jesus is at the temple, he's meeting opposition, like it's celebration of Hanukkah. And this time you have the people celebrating Jesus coming in, kind of the opposite. Uh, but now it's not the time of Hanukkah, even though they have some, some things kind of pointing to that. Um, and since we're talking about Jesus being the true king and questions about that, this is actually going to parallel to the trial of Pontius Pilate. Oh, Because that was, actually the trial goes on for quite some time. So it's going to connect with a couple more things, but the last little bit of Pontius' trial with Jesus was, who is the true king? And the last thing that Jesus actually says to Pilate, it is basically that he was right in, you were right in saying that I am the king. And he's talking about his kingdom not being of this world. So the idea of who is the true king is one of the themes here, and it's also connecting to the triumphal entry. So this, on this side, that one's going to be a little bit confusing for you, probably. That is the event that comes up well, narratively after wedding piece of Cana, which I don't, I don't know if you remember what that is. Oh, no, you're checking your phone. I thought you were about to cheat. <laughs> is that when uh, Peter declared to our... No. Actually, we don't have that one in in John's Gospel. He doesn't, he doesn't have a, a Peter's declaration that Jesus is Christ. Um, so this is also going to be looking at the temple, and this is Jesus clearing the temple. I can get this pen to work. Jesus clearing the temple. So Jesus clearing the temple is very much on point with Jesus at the temple for, for Hanukkah, uh, in part because Hanukkah is when they're cleansing the temple. And it's also going to be on in part with the triumphal entry because it's basically Jesus going to the, well, the throne of God, which is going to be at the temple, not, not in the polit political power, but at the temple. And he's going to be cleansing it to basically bring himself in. Yeah. So there's a lot going on underneath the surface, as is typical of John. But the main things will be the cleansing of the temple and kingship, Jesus being king of the people. And this is why I have so many books this morning, as people were commenting as I was coming in, because we have to go to some places we normally don't go uh, as Lutherans. Thanks. Uh, question, comments? So the Feast of Hanukkah is clearing the temple? Is um, largely yes. Because the, the Feast of Hanukkah is looking to when, and we're going to be getting into this more, uh, but the Feast of Hanukkah is basically when uh, the people reclaim the temple from a pagan power and then they have to cleanse it. And uh, the most well-known tradition of that is coming down in the form of the lampstand, so the menorah. But that's a kind of a different focus than what John has. So John is looking more towards the cleansing aspect of it. Uh, the menorah is looking towards uh, basically God allowing proper worship in the, in the temple for eight days for uh, 
for the people. So uh, the menorah and the lampstand is looking to when uh, the oil for the lampstand, which was expected to last over one day, lasted eight days, the eight days that it took to actually prepare more oil so that it can uh, continue being lit. Because according to the Old Testament standard, the lampstand must be continuously lit for all time. So it can't go out. Is that the same idea of the eternal light in, in our churches? Of what? Eternal light. Um, not eternal. exactly. No? Uh, because this is the light of creation, so it's more of a creational theme. So you could try to connect it to eternal life, but uh, since the lampstand is looking to um, the Holy Spirit as well as creation, it's more God's presence within the creation for all time. Which would lead to eternal life, but that's not the not the main concept. Like it leads to it, but not the main concept. I know that I've been in a, a number of Lutheran churches um, that did have the eternal light, and some that don't. You know, like they have a light and it's always lit or whatever. I don't know. I think it. Uh, do you are, are you familiar with that? Oh. I, I think it was down in the United States that I saw that uh, in Lutheran. I yeah, I don't know if anybody else has, but yeah, I just wondered about it. it wasn't in every church. Some, some had it. <clears throat> well, so kind of knowing the underlying themes, let's get into the passage itself. So this is John chapter 12, and this is going to be verses 12 to 19. Does anybody like to read? Or would anyone like to read? The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it was written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the word has gone after him. World. The world has gone after him, sorry. That'll be a very different <laughs> Um. Yeah, yeah. So, looking at the beginning there, in verse 12, so next day, next day from what? Some of the trick questions are yeah. no. no, of course not. No, the, the, that hasn't happened yet. No, no yeah, <laughs> something happened. There was a, a dinner that night. Was that when the lamb gets brought in to the? Yeah, this is the tricky part because if John is saying the next day, the next day from actually what? Most likely, it's the next day from when he actually entered into Bethany. So keep in mind. Uh, the Jewish reckoning of the day is from evening to morning. So the anointing was happening in the evening, which is the same day as the triumphal entry. So Sean, if he's saying the next day, he might be using Roman reckoning to say the next day after the anointing, or he's saying the next day as in after Jesus entered into Bethany, now he's entering into Bethany. It's complicated. It's complicated. But essentially, he's he's saying... This is right after the, the dinner with his anointing. So he's saying the great crowd, well, there's a great crowd that's actually starting to form a couple of verses or earlier. So these are the people who have heard that Jesus has come into Bethany. So these are the ones who know that Jesus <laughs> raised Lazarus. So this is the great crowd that um, 
understanding who Jesus is, but has also come for the festival. And what's that festival? Just said it. The bringing of the lamb. Well, the bringing of the lamb is the preparation. The Passover. Is Passover. Passover. Yeah. Bringing the lamb is the preparation yeah. for the Passover. Passover starts on um, 15th of the month of Nisan, whereas the bringing in the lamb is the 10th. So there's there's a few days there. But the Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, begins on the 15th and it runs for seven days. So uh, a Sabbath of Sabbath days. Okay. Um, so Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. This is just kind of expected. Well, first you're going to Jerusalem if you're going for the feast. But since this is also the day of entry of the Lamb into the household, that's why John is kind of highlighting this. Um, the other gospel accounts, they don't highlight Jesus coming into the household of Lazarus, which is also what John wants to bring in, but Jesus is the Lamb that's coming into that household. But uh, the other gospel writers, they definitely want to highlight that Jesus is coming into Jerusalem at this time. So, with the Passover, what you do before you start the feast, which is on the 15th, on the 10th, you have uh, the lamb come into the household, and it's part of the household, and it gets sacrificed for the household at the 14th, at twilight, so this is at the very end of the day, and then you immediately have the feast at the beginning at uh, the 15th, which is amazing. Yes, yes, it's different for us because we count days differently. But basically, it's showing that Jesus is the sacrificial lamb that's coming into the household of the nation of faith. Yeah, I have a question. Yep. So they, they have the lamb, and then at twilight, which is the evening hours, right, from the light to the darkness, that's when they kill it? Yes. And then, and then they eat it right after? They eat it um, right after in that evening. So mm -hmm. since they're counting evening to morning, yeah. twilight is right before the evening. Yeah. And then they kill it while it's still the 14th. And then it basically rolls over into the 15th. And that's when they eat. So the equivalent for us is if we were to bring in the lamb at, say, like 11 p.m., we slaughter it at 11 and then try to prepare it so that like 12.01 in the morning we can start eating it. That would be the equivalent that they're starting it a few hours earlier because they reckon it a few hours earlier. Okay. So, Jesus, sacrificial lamb. So, try to put it into our calendar. <laughs> They would sacrifice the lamb on Thursday at twilight and then eat it that evening. So Jesus, on Thursday. On Thursday. So Jesus is actually sacrificed on the cross a day later than sort of. <laughs> um and this this is one of the interesting nuances the gospel writers have, because um when they're having the actual meal, Jesus is giving his body and his blood to them in the Lord's Supper at that time. So they're actually partaking of the meal, but Jesus had not yet died. However, they're still receiving the blood of the New Testament in, uh, there. So Jesus is basically declaring that he has died and they're receiving it now. But temporally, he hasn't done that yet. God's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I guess it was just as much a miracle then as it is now. <laughs> it's from a human way of thinking, right? I have a question. Hmm. I thought that uh, the Pharisees and high priests thought they had to deal with Jesus, mm -hmm. his trial and everything, mm -hmm. and also the crucifixion, to have that done before the celebration or the feast of the mm -hmm. Jewish people started. That's what I thought. Yeah. Or maybe I'm wrong. No, 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 no. And this is one of the interesting 
um, presumed discrepancies in the Gospels. It's like which date is actually the date for uh, the Passover meal, because John's giving us a little bit of a different view than the other three Gospels. Because John's the only one who who uh, mentions that the Pharisees, as well as some of the other people, are waiting to have that Passover feast. Uh, the other three gospel writers, they don't talk about it. So what appears to be happening in John's depiction is he's actually showing how there's either a different calendar date, different way of counting the calendar, which they have found a different calendar that's off by a day. And that's a possible explanation for it. And I have some people use that as an explanation for it. I don't like that explanation because I don't think it's terribly accurate because if they're the Pharisees and if they're doing this in the house of worship, why would they be allowing two different dates? That doesn't make any sense. Anyways, um, so I think the easiest explanation is that uh, they're seeing this as kind of an elongated event as well. So the actual practice should be that they're eating it right then in the evening, uh, Thursday evening, but since they were also expecting to kill Jesus, uh, it is unlawful for them, or unclean, it would be unclean for them, not necessarily unlawful, but unclean for them to be around a corpse, as well as celebrate things with, with uh, holy food. So for them, uh, it seems like they're trying to delay this because they didn't exactly know when they would be able to capture Jesus. And they didn't know when he would be executed. So it seems as though they're delaying the actual celebration of the feast and, and we're intending to take it after Jesus Christ's death on the 15th. So they were trying to keep it on the same day, but they weren't doing it in the evening as they should. <laughs> that seems to be the easiest explanation to me. Uh, but we'll, but I'll probably explain that again when when it comes up. I think it's in chapter yeah chapter eighteen. Chapter eighteen is when it comes up. Chapter nineteen. Anyways, we'll deal with it next year when I get to that. Next year. <laughs> Does the lamb have to be hung for you to bleed? No, no. When what is kosher when it comes to lamb? Well, it'll be the same for any sacrificial animal because you're uh, cutting its its neck mm -hmm. and then try to bleed it out as much as you possibly can mm -hmm. because it's forbidden for you to consume the blood. The idea is that uh, if you're trying to eat the blood, then you're taking part in a ceremony that God did not ordain. So um, the life blood belongs to God. So you're trying to drain it of its blood the blood is used uh, for consecration. This is also why in Passover you have people marking the door frames with blood. So if this is this is to designate the place of soul, so that uh, uh, yeah, basically you're in line with the with the Passover feast back in Exodus, and then the animal itself you would consume. So yeah, it, they they don't. To my knowledge, I've never heard of anything in the scriptures about hanging the animal to, to drain it of its blood. I'm just thinking time, time wise, they slaughter and then they eat immediately. Hmm? Cooking time. Well, that's also in line with the Old Testament sacrifices, is that if it's dedicated for a very specific purpose, it is dedicated for that specific purpose. So you're doing it in haste. So, so, so with um, the Passover piece, especially uh, in Exodus chapter 12, and this is coming up, there's a couple of different times where it's saying that this is a meal eaten in haste because you're expected to be freed in the Exodus that night. And they are. So they're eating, eating the feast with the lamb as fast as they can with their loins girded because they have to be ready for action. They have to be ready to leave. So the idea is still present within some of the other sacrifices that this is for that specific purpose right in that moment. And you're not necessarily looking beyond that moment. Like this is right now we have to have it. So the 
uh, only only extensions you would really have for something like this would be for the peace offering, sometimes also called the Thanksgiving offering. But with the peace offering, what's going on is uh, most of the meat is not being burned on the altar. For the other sacrifices, uh, most of the meat is. Some of the meat is going to the high priest or priest in general, depending on what sacrifice it is, because that's payment to the priest. But for a um, peace offering, it's the idea of having fellowship with God. So this meat is dedicated to God, but you're sharing in it. So uh, the priest, when he's carving up the animal for this, like part of it's sacrificed on the altar, part of it's given to the priest as a payment, and a good large chunk of the meat, well, not literally a chunk, but most of the meat is given to the person who had offered it, and that person is to consume it there at the temple, or they can actually bring it home to them uh, and then share amongst their family, because this is you communing with God in the sacrifice. The only other sacrifice you could possibly do that with where you communing with God and one another, not at the temple, but as lay people, the only other sacrifice that's possible is the Passover. Only a but with this one, um, the stipulation is you have one day, one day to eat this meat. Otherwise, you're you basically desecrated the meat, and the meat must be burned. You cannot you cannot eat it after one day. And so there's always there's always an idea of haste within the sacrifices. You can't leave any of it over. It's dedicated for the specific purpose of worship at that time. Sort of like they couldn't uh, eat the. <laughs> or, or in haste is relative. It would still take a number of hours to slaughter the animal, drain the blood, and cook it. It would still take some time, yes. Yeah. But the actual consumption should be in haste. Yeah. However, I will say um, the priests, since they're this is their job to slaughter animals and do all this, and there's also a whole bunch of priests at the top. Like it would actually be done relatively quickly. Like if you have a, a really skilled butcher, a butcher can take apart an animal in pretty short amount of time, relatively short amount of time. But yeah, if you also have other priests working on this, because like this is an entire tribe of the nation of Israel who's dedicated to the priestly profession. Yeah, it, it can be done relatively quickly. So the lambs would be brought to the temple to be slaughtered? No, no, it's in the household. It's in the household. Yeah, so this this is the most unusual feast, I would say, because you have um, actions going on at the temple, but it's also in the household itself. So the head of the household would be expected to be the one who's uh, slaughtering the lamb and and taking responsibility for the rest of the household. Yeah. So when Christ uh, had the Last Supper with his disciples, did they have a lamb that they slaughtered? If Jesus was fulfilling the law, yes, he did. They just don't record it. Well, they don't record the meal at all, really. They mention it. Yeah. The highlight in all four gospel accounts, well, in, in three of the gospel accounts, John doesn't talk about the Lord's Supper. John, John's focus is the speeches at the Supper. But in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, their focus is always going to be the Lord's Supper. So this is actually taking, taking part different from the Passover meal itself. So this is all right. Jesus is not giving them a hunk of lamb and saying, this is my body. That's, yeah, okay. He makes a reference about them not wanting to be around a body. Oh, a dead body, yeah. A dead body? Yeah. So are they buried immediately, the Jewish people? Yes. Uh, pretty, pretty quickly, anyways. Hmm. Although that's not... Um, uh, a law ordained by God that's just 
tradition. I expect them to be buried in, by the, by the law because it's like you have to dispose of the bodies correctly in, in, the, in the Old Testament. But just general hygiene, you don't want a dead body in the desert. That's gonna that's gonna expire quickly. I think it's 40 hours I once read in the Middle East, or I don't know to which group that uh, relates, whether you know, Jewish people or Muslims or, you know, if they have to bury their, their dead within 40 hours, what you said, a day and, that's a day and 16 hours. Because of the heat, probably, it's weather thing. Climate yeah. conditions, probably. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same reason uh, we don't have a lot of organic artifacts from from that area of the world because mm -hmm. they would just rot and expire. Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to say uh, Egypt, which has a very dry heat and then you can preserve everything. Um, not so with Israel. No. Well, Jesus was. Buried immediately too, wasn't it? He's taken to the tomb. Yeah. As the probably has to sleep some across too. Don't know what happened to those those guys' bodies. I don't know. No, no mention of that. I can only tell you about uh, the thief on the right hand. This was like, like he went to paradise that day, but what happened to his body? I don't know. Anyway, so uh, verse, verse 13, so they took palm branches and went, went out to meet him, shouting, palm branches, hmm, hmm, and I've asked this before, I don't, I, I, you probably, you already know that, hmm, who else mentions that these were palm branches, who else? Which one of the gospel writers, you mean? Yes. Nobody else. I'd have to go look it up. Nobody else. There we go. That's it. Nobody else. So um, John is the only one who does this. So that kind of tips you off. John has a specific agenda that he wants to portray. And I was already kind of going through that up there with how this is uh, paralleled by different things in this gospel. Uh, and John is actually being incredibly redundant when he's talking about the palm branches because he's because he actually Greek would be and they had the palm fronds of the palm trees why are you being so redundant john well obviously he wants us to pay attention so this is uh, interesting as well, because they're also extremely rare words. So the word for um, palm branch, because keep in mind, there's actually two words there. It just says palm branches here in the NIV, but it's palm fronds and palm trees. Okay. So the, the fronds thing, the branches thing, this is actually coming from a Coptic word. Coptic is Egyptian Greek. So it's very, very specific, very localized. And it comes up only here in the New Testament. So there's one use in the New Testament and only one time in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Um, and I, I should actually, Greek translation of the Old Testament in the sense that this isn't actually one of the books of the Old Testament. So you can't find, so if you look in our Bibles, in the 39 books of the Old Testament, you won't find it because this is in the Greek translation which of the Old Testament, which includes other books. So the only other time that it actually comes up in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, also known as the Septuagint, uh, it comes up in 1 Maccabees. Which is why I brought these books. This is an apocrypha, which has uh, the the Old Testament books that were carried over, but aren't included as uh, divinely inspired in our Bibles today. And I have here specifically a, a rendition of 
second map of these, which also includes a little bit of commentary and critical notes. Uh, so this is part of the Apocrypha. But we actually have to go to extra biblical literature to understand this thing. Yay. Um, so the occurrence of the word in First Maccabees, which is uh, 1351, uh, it is actually dealing with not the cleansing of the temple, but the cleansing of the citadel in Jerusalem. I'll get to that later. I'll deal with Second Maccabees first because it gives us the details for the cleansing of the temple. The cleansing of the citadel actually happens second in time. So we'll go with this. And um, yeah, it's uh, it has to do with the Maccabean revolt as, as the title says. So it's uh, first and second Maccabees look into the Maccabean war. What's the Maccabean war? <laughs> I covered this a, a while ago, so, but I'll have to refresh everybody's memory because I don't expect everybody to remember. So the Maccabean War or the Maccabean Revolt began in I'll have Mac, Maccabean Revolt. Really began 167 BC, at least the background and background causes. So, uh, what's going on is the area is not owned by the Jews, technically speaking. They're under an empire at that time. This is before the Roman Empire steps in. We're used to the Roman Empire, dealing with the Roman Empire, the New Testament. But they only come into the stage well, about a century after this point. So the people we're looking at at this time are the Seleucids. Who on earth are they? Well, the Seleucids are actually one of the successor empires to Alexander the Great's empire. That's Greek. Yeah. yeah. So Alexander the Great, uh, 356 to 323 BC. He was a great conqueror, terrible emperor, <laughs> terrible, terrible emperor, because uh, he was able to basically conquer almost the entire known world at that time. Um, so fantastic in terms of conquering, but uh, he didn't really know how to administer the empire. And when he got sick and died relatively young, so 356 to 323, He's only 33 when he died. Uh, when, when he was on his deathbed, uh, people were asking him, uh, who do you leave the empire to? And very unhelpfully, he said, to the strongest. This then led to basically all of his generals picking sides and fighting against each other. In my opinion, the only smart one was Ptolemy who basically holed himself up in Egypt and then just stayed in Egypt the entire time. And like he defended the border, but he, he just stayed there the entire time and he didn't really care to try and conquer everything else. Everybody tried to conquer everything else. Uh, one of the gen generals, Seleucus, uh, he founded the Seleucid Empire, which is basically what you would think the Middle East is today. Okay? So part of that included uh, Israel and he had control over that. So go uh, 150 or so years after that point, you get to one of his successors, one of, one of the people in charge of that uh, empire. And this is Antiochus Epiphanes. The reason why he has Epiphanes is that he was religiously inclined, he believed himself to be God. He had an epiphany that he was a God in human flesh which is very unhelpful for the Jews. It, because if you go to a Jew and say, I'm God in human flesh, what, what would you expect their reaction to be? <laughs> crucify him, crucify Well, no, they, they would actually be stoning him, stone him, but for Jesus, it, it ended up being the star. Anyways, but yeah, you'd be accused of blasphemy. So uh, 
Antiochus Epiphanes, when he's declaring himself to be God and is in the Jerusalem area, what he actually does is he takes over Jerusalem, takes over the temple in conjunction with the high priest of the day, the Jewish high priest of the day. So the high priest is committing blasphemy right then and there. And he takes all the temple treasures to help finance some wars he's in. So this leads to the family of the Maccabees. So this is why it's called the Maccabean Revolt. So the Maccabees are the are uh, some Levites, so they're the priestly class. They decide we have to stop this. So they rally up the people in order to fight the war against this guy who's going to be God. And after a number of years, they're able to basically take over Israel again, more or less. So Israel is one of the very few places in the Seleucid Empire that actually has independence because they're able to cast off this guy. But the temple had Jerusalem and the temple itself have been desecrated. They, they, they've had a pagan guy come in who's held pagan festivals in the temple, so they have to cleanse it. So when they eventually get in, uh, they reclaim the temple in 164 BC, and this is the uh, month of Gisla uh, 25. So that's the start of Hanukkah is when they start rededicating the temple, and then it's a it's an eight-day-long observance, like commemorating how long it took the oil to, to uh, be made and the menorah was still a lit. So that seems to be like all from the data we have, like I have no reason to say that that didn't happen. I'm it's the book that's it that it's in, Second like Maccabees. This isn't divinely inspired. However, Jesus is at the temple at the feast of dedication in John. So there is at least some sort of God approved worship at this time. I don't, I don't think we should probably celebrate exactly how the Jews celebrate it because they have a very particular focus, but yeah, we can celebrate Hanukkah. Um, so they have to take back the temple and they have to rededicate it. So, so you're saying is, it's okay to wish somebody a happy Hanukkah? The Christian version of Hanukkah, sure. <laughs> But yeah, G Jesus was at the temple in Hanukkah, so, and John is just explicitly mentioning that's kind of why he's there. So it seems like, yes, from a Christian perspective, there is some place for it. I don't know exactly how to observe it. I haven't really done it myself. But it's also not one of the holy days as as outlined in uh, the Old Testament scriptures, so that it's not as though this is ordained for Christ specifically and so, anyway yeah so it's Hanukkah <laughs> there is some place for Hanukkah in the Christian calendar but I I haven't done enough study into it to really try and figure out how okay so the people on the screen can see this yeah um People in the room, I'm sorry, you can't, because we don't really have many apocryphus here. Uh, I do think that there's a copy of the Good News Bible on the shelf there, but that Good News Bible doesn't have the apocrypha in it. Um, that's how Good News Bibles do. Because uh, Good News Bible is one of the approved translations by Roman Catholicism, and they still use the apocrypha in the Bible. That's why you find some Good News Bibles with that in there. Um, I'm not using the Good News Translation, I'm using the RSV, because the RSV, the Revised Standard Version, one of the older versions we have uh, in English, um, I mean, like, in the 20th century, one of the older ones. Uh, this is also a, a Catholic-approved translation, Catholic main translation, so yes, it also has the Apocrypha. So this is from the book of 2 Maccabees, chapter 10. 
Now, Maccabeus and his followers, and this is uh, Simon Maccabeus, uh, the Lord leading them on, recovered the temple and the city, the city of Jerusalem. And they tore down the altars which had been built in the public square by the foreigners and also destroyed the sacred precepts. So they're saying we're destroying all the pagan worshiping stuff in the city. They purified the sanctuary. So this is the Holy of Holies in, in, in the temple. So this is the holiest place you can go. Only priests are allowed to go in there. So they purified the sanctuary and made another altar of sacrifice. And then striking fire out of flint, they offered sacrifices after a lapse of two years. So, so uh, Antiochus Epiphanes started taking stuff out of the temple in 167. They brought it back in 164. So it took a little bit of time before they could actually start worshiping God again, because there was actually a period where it was just kind of forbidden. Uh, oh, and they burned incense and lighted lamps and set out the bread of the presence. So all standard stuff you're supposed to do as outlined in Exodus and Leviticus. And when they had done this, they fell prostrate and besought the Lord that they might never again fall into such misfortunes, but that if they should ever sin, they might be disciplined by him with forbearance and not be handed over to blasphemous and barbarous nations. It happened that on the same day on which the sanctuary had been profaned by the foreigners, the purification of the sanctuary took place, that is, on the 25th day of the same month, which is Hislev. And they celebrated it for eight days with rejoicing in the manner of the Feast of Booths, remembering how not long before, during the Feast of Booths, they had been wandering in the mountains and caves like wild animals, therefore bearing ivy wreathed wands and beautiful branches and also fronds of palm. They offered hymns of thanksgiving to him who had given success to the purifying of his own holy place. They decreed by public ordinance and vote that the whole nation of the Jews should observe these days every year. So that's why I'm, I'm saying that this is kind of more of a civic holiday. Like it's, it's definitely religious in theme, but it's also kind of a civic holiday because it's they decreed it by public ordinance that we should as a nation celebrate this. So yeah, if, if you really want to press it, um, and you have some groups saying like, oh, well, in the Bible, we're not celebrating, I don't know, Canada Day. So we shouldn't as Christians celebrate Canada Day. Why not? Jesus celebrated Hanukkah. Why can't we do this? Anyways, um, so there's a couple things mentioned there. So for the people on screen, you can see uh, in verse six, they celebrated in the manner of the Feast of Booths, uh, also known as the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles should have been celebrated ooh, about two months before. Okay? Uh, because this is one of the divinely appointed festivals in the Old Testament. Like, you have to celebrate this. But you need the temple to celebrate it. They did not have the temple. So they did the best that they possibly could while they were kind of exiled from the temple. The temple. But they still needed to, to uh, observe this. So when they actually took over the temple area and cleansed it, then they decided, hey, let's celebrate the Feast of Booths, uh, uh, Tabernacles. And one of the things that you have for the Feast of Tabernacles is you have one of the days with palm fronds. It's just something that you have in celebration because uh, you know, the Feast of Booths, the Tabernacles, goes on for multiple days. But for uh, one of the days, you're bringing palm fronds forth and bringing them up to the temple itself. So it wasn't unusual for palm fronds to be around and used on Palm Sunday <clears throat> for I mean when Jesus entered Jerusalem that was absolutely unusual it was it made no sense <laughs> oh okay no because that's the Passover it's not Hanukkah oh I uh, yeah okay. I mean, of the feast of booths 
No, I mean, what she means is they used palm fronds before for other things, therefore it wasn't a departure to use palm fronds for, you know, anything. It's like, not, not, they never used palm fronds for anything before. Ah, so it's not unusual, but it's definitely not the main draw. So in okay. the case of tabernacles, uh, you have it during one of the days, and I will quickly go to Leviticus uh, three. So the the feast days that are ordained for the Jewish people are in uh, Leviticus chapter twenty three. So the feast of tabernacles starts uh, being being uh, described in verse thirty three. And if you go through all this, so on the 15th day of the seventh month, blah, blah, blah. Um, so if you go through all of this, it, it outlines burnt offerings, grain offerings, sacrifices, drink offerings. Um, and if you go through all this, it, it mentions palms here in verse 40. So on the, on the first day of tabernacles, you are to take branches from luxuriant trees, from palms, willows, and other leafy trees, and rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. So um, palms aren't the central focus. Like you could take pretty much any branch, any branch that would have a decent effect. So with the other gospel writers, when they're describing Palm Sunday, they're not talking about the palms, they're just talking about branches in general. So they're definitely making a connection to kind of the cleansing of the temple in general, but they're not having the exact same focus as John, because if, because if John's focus was just, hey, they're celebrating tabernacles, he'll just mention branches in the past, and he might mention palm branches, but if he's being redundant and saying palm branches and palm trees, he's trying to make a point. And what is his point? Well, we're also, that's why I'm also going to go to 1st Maccabees. 1st Maccabees chapter 13. I have a question. Just yes. They, they also put their clothes down, right? Their garments or mm -hmm. their coats. Yeah, their yeah. coats. Maybe. So does that have a special meaning too? Putting down the clothing? Putting Royalty. Down? Royalty. Royalty. <laughs> yeah. Sort of. Um, it's humility of the people, I would say, is kind of the main thing there. But John's the only one who does not mention the laying down of garments. His focus is specifically on the palm branches, and it actually has to do with um, conquest and royalty. Because if it, if it was specifically royalty, then why would John omit such an important reference? So it's a little bit more humility of the people and praise of Jesus than his um, uh, kingship. Like putting on a red carpet? Or... Sort of. Uh, I guess you could say that. I mean, all the special people get that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um. So in 2nd Maccabees, you have the detailed accounts of the uh, cleansing of the temple. But in 1st Maccabees, which I have to talk about, um, we're going to be dealing with a different aspect and a little bit more of a secular aspect, actually. So after the cleansing of the temple, actually, I, I, should, I should probably outline this. So ancient and medieval cities. If you if you take down the city wall and bust in, have you taken the whole city yet? Not the inner court. There we go. That's what I was looking for. Um, yeah, because in ancient cities, like you'd have outer walls, maybe a series of outer walls. Uh, Jerusalem didn't really have that at the, at this time. Like they did have an outer wall, um, but there's usually for royalty and nobles and inner keep. You have another building in there. And this is also fortified, and this is the last stronghold of the people. So if 
your outer defenses fall, well, you can still hold out for a while in the keep. So there is a citadel in Jerusalem that has not yet been taken over, even though uh, people have come in and cleansed the temple area. So they have to take the citadel. They have to take over the administrative center of the city. So this is what's going on in 1st Maccabees chapter 13. Um, so the men in the citadel at Jerusalem were prevented from going out to the country and back to buy and sell. So they were very hungry and many of them perished from famine. Then they cried to Simon, that is Simon Maccabeus, to make peace with them, and he did so. But he expelled them from there and cleansed the citadel from its pollutions. So, so it wasn't as though they were like, oh no, we have nowhere to put our excrement. Uh, it, it's actually them being non-Jews and them making the space unclean. Uh, so they would also be having, say, like um, unclean foods in there and stuff like that. So, so they have to cleanse this as well. On the 23rd day of the second month, in the, the 171st year of the Jews, and we have here a little note at the bottom, uh, 141 BC. Um, the Jews entered it with praise and palm branches and with harps and cymbals and string instruments and with hymns and songs, because a great enemy had been crushed and removed from Israel. And Simon decreed that every year they should celebrate this day with rejoicing. He strengthened the fortifications on the temple hill outside the citadel, and he and his men dwelt there. And Simon saw that John, his son, so John Matthias, had reached manhood, so he made him commander of all the forces, and he dwelt in Gazara. So uh, you have the cleansing of, of the citadel, and that's also marked by palm branches. And keep in mind, this is the only location in all of the Greek Old Testament that has the same word that John's using to describe the palm branches in his, his account of the triumphal entry. So odds are these things are actually connected. So John is not just thinking about the temple, as in the worship center, but he's also thinking of the administrative, the kingly center of what's going on. Yeah. And he's all, uh, oh yeah, and he's mentioning this as, uh, uh, Mac, first Maccabees is mentioning this as the 23rd day of the second month. So this is a completely different day than, than the piece of dedication. So are Jews still celebrating this today? And what are they calling it? Uh, I can't tell you. I, I don't know. But they are celebrating it. Actively or passively, they're celebrating it somewhere. Um, if you look at a Jewish calendar, there's some sort of festival day somewhere. There, it's, it's kind of similar to some uh, Christian calendars. Uh, Christian calendars usually include more celebrations than saints. Um, when the Russian Orthodox congregation was having their uh, meeting with us here at the church, I was talking with the, the president of the congregation, and he was looking at some of our liturgical materials, and it's like, oh, I want to see how your church calendar matched with ours. I'm like, oh, yeah, well, I think it's mostly the same. Uh, and then I said, minus, like, the same days. Like, we don't do regular observances the same day. And he said, like, oh, well, wow, I, I have this Orthodox app. So every single day it tells you what saints are commemorated on that day. So usually there's like five or six saints per day, every single day, sometimes more uh, in the year. So you can you can observe whatever saint you want. <laughs> but it's been a while. So we so they so we have a whole bunch of them. Uh, so that's similar to Judaism, where it's been a while. They have a whole bunch of more uh, civically minded holy days that have been brought in over time and some of these would also be local depending on uh, which group of jews ended up where and what was um, done by the grace of god for them in, in that particular area yeah <laughs> so I, just, I don't know the name of the festival observing the cleansing of the citadel. But they're definitely still celebrating it somewhere. I don't think it 
I would assume it's not as prominent as say uh, Hanukkah and uh, Purim, which are kind of brought in later on, uh, uh, well after the time of Moses. Uh, let's see. I have to pretty much everything. Yeah, pretty much. I think I got pretty much everything I really need to uh, with this. Okay, so I've beaten this to death. Let's continue. <laughs> um, so all this to show John is making reference to things that are not necessarily in our purview. Uh, so this is the Feast of Tabernacles. This is the cleansing of the temple in the Maccabean Revolt. This is also the cleansing of the citadel at a later point during the Maccabean Revolt, or a far time later in the Maccabean Revolt. Not against Antiochus Epiphanes, I should mention, but um, uh, Demetrius, King Demetrius. He, he tries to take the things over. I, I have a question here. Oh, yeah. Tabernacle. I remember... <clears throat> Downtown in Victoria, I think it's on Quarter Street. Uh, a Mormon driving, driving along there, and I see the word tabernacle connected with the church. Now, I think that was a Christian church. I don't know exactly where it is, but it's sort of past when you go towards the city center, past the police station, and before you get to one of the churches on the left. Which is a reform church or something. Uh, um, and I thought tabernacle in connection with the Christian church. And I always meant to kind of look it up in my dictionaries. But then so, uh, quite literally, the word tabernacle means a tent. Tabernacle means a tent. Yes. Like a meeting place, maybe. Um, well, it's not exactly. Uh, the tabernacle is sometimes. Like in the Old Testament, it's called the tent of meeting. Yes. Uh, but it is the tabernacle. It is the tent that you go to. Yes. However, um, I I'm not aware of almost any Christian group today that actually uses yeah. the word tabernacle for a church. Mm -hmm. um, if there are, it'd be few and far between that would use the term tabernacle. In part because it's a dated term. But uh, mostly because it's also a false rendering of what on earth that word means. Because <laughs> uh, I really doubt somebody's going into a tent. Now, if you have, say, like a revival, as some Christian churches do, well, they usually do that in tents. And sure, you can call that a tabernacle. And, like, that's, that's just accurate. But the only group that I really know that constantly calls their buildings tabernacles are the Mormons. Yeah. Yeah, because if you go to anywhere Mormon, usually they're making a tabernacle, which is more often than not a stone or a brick building, and then they're just like, that's completely wrong. They have a uh, tabernacle choir, right? Well, yeah, because that's the main tabernacle that they actually have. That's their central tabernacle in uh, Utah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's they they quite regularly call their spaces tabernacles, even though that's linguistically a wrong term. But they want to try and say that this is the place that Moses spoke of in Exodus and, and Leviticus. And so, yeah. <laughs> I'm always suspicious when I see some somebody like name their building the tabernacle because odds are it's going to be more. <laughs> not not necessarily every time, but the vast majority of the times I've seen. Um, it's kind of similar to the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses all, almost always calling their buildings temples. Yeah. Or they call it Kingdom Hall. Yeah. In Duncan, it's Kingdom Hall. Okay. So uh, getting back to John chapter 12, so verse 13, talked about the palm branches, connections to um, uh, uh, First and second Maccabees, and now people are shouting, Hosanna! Why? <laughs> or 
or or I, I should probably give you a little bit more context. Um, Hosanna is kind of an isolate from from where they're quoting us, but uh, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Um, that that phrase is kind of cherry pitched from from a larger passage. But uh, why are they saying this? It means safe. I find them here. Lord, save oh, us. There's another reason. Are you still having help? I don't know what my Bible says. Hmm? What was that, Matthew? I find the behind, and it says here. Any great expression meaning save? You're looking at the wrong note. Could <laughs> be. <laughs> um, Mine says pay for divine help. Again, it's the, the, not, not the. Um, not the linguistic textual note, it is the citation note that's that I'm, that I'm asking I'm asking about. No. Okay. So um in in your study Bibles, uh so a few of you have study Bibles. In your study Bibles, uh there will be a note. Uh, next to Hosanna, and the, and the one in bold, at least in this one that I have for the Concordia Study Bible of the NIV, uh, the bold one will be in reference to a um, uh, to a meaning. So it's trying to translate this. But textual notes are in the unbolded letters next to them. So if you go to the end of the line, so blessed is you comes in the name of the Lord, you have uh, one note there. And it's going to tell you in the margin in between. This is coming from Psalm 118, verses 25 to 26. That's what I'm that's what I'm looking at. So so people aren't just saying uh save me, because why are they saying save me? Like, do they really know what's going on? Not exactly. What they're doing is they're making a citation of scripture. And this is going to be one of the important things that we're going to be dealing with. So um, in Psalm 118, verses 25 to 26, the fullness of this is, Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. What's, what's the house of the Lord? The temple? Yes, the temple. Uh, what what is what is Hanukkah celebrating? The cleansing of the temple. The cleansing of the temple. That's right. So, and they're also coming around with palm branches. So, uh, they're very much thinking things in terms of of uh, tabernacles, the piece of tabernacles, but also with the cleansing of the temple. Um, Psalm one eighteen is also one of the psalms that you would be singing in in uh, preparation for the Feast of Tabernacles. It is one of the appointed psalms for that occasion. So they're kind of going along with the theme of tabernacles, but even unbeknownst to them as they're citing this, this passage, they're, they're looking also to um, uh, the Hanukkah cleansing of the temple as well as kind of the cleansing of the citadel as John's trying to hint a little bit heavily there. So this, this is specifically why they're saying it. But I'll even mention there's a fun thing. It's more and more of a fun thing for me. I'm, I'm sorry. But it's going to be a fun thing for me <laughs> to try and show you what on earth is going on. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm sorry, I'm going to have to start off with Hebrew because I can't transliterate this in my head. I'm, I'm very, very sorry. Um, so I have to go. Uh, oops, uh, I have to go. Okay, I have to do I have to do that, sorry. So this is uh Yasha. 
And that's the verb for to say. So to say. Now, in order to get this to where we need it, um, you have yo, ja, let's see. I have to conjugate this in my head. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat on this. I'm sorry. I have to I have to cheat on this. And it's not allowing me to cheat. Internet, why? Why are you doing this to me? Okay. Um that's what I thought. I, I thought that was weird. Okay. I know I shouldn't trust that. And this is yo she ah, and that is known as a um, um a he field imperative. So this is actually a different form of this verb yo she ah, which is basically God causes us our like cause our salvation or save us. Uh, kind of emphasizing that the person who you're calling upon, this is the person that can cause your salvation. This isn't exactly what we find in in uh, any of the Old Testament accounts because Hosanna is a little bit different than this. So what they're actually doing here is they're in the Gospels adding on this little particle. Actually, sorry, it would be, uh, I'd actually take that off. Right. And then this is basically saying us. So if you add on another, so it's saying save us. Um, it, so yeah, this is complicated because it's going into Hebrew, also looking a little bit more towards Ar Aramaic. And you have to go along a little bit for this. Anyways, so this is fun for me because, yeah, they're referencing this, but uh, they're also calling upon Jesus. Do you remember Jesus's name in Hebrew? Joshua? What? Joshua? Yes. Jesus is uh, the Greek form of it, yeah. but yeah, Joshua. 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 So uh, it's actually a derivation from this verb, or more accurately, the root. Because when you have uh, three letters in Hebrew, that's that's where you get a root, and that it has its own specific meaning. And then you do whatever you want to add on letters or yeah. or change some letter. Or, well, not change letters, but change vowels. Uh, in order to make it a verb or an adjective or a noun, but Hebrew words are based in a three-letter root. Even the ones that only occur as two letters, there's another letter in there you just can't see. Which, <laughs> anyways, uh, I have to, to double-check my notes to make sure I'm getting the vowel pointing right on this. Where is it? Where did I put this? I know I did this. I did this yesterday. There it is. Okay. Got the yellow there. I mean, hey. Okay. And this is yeah, oh, Shuha or Joshua. Um, as as you may not be aware, uh, there was no J until a few hundred years ago. 
J is the youngest letter of the alphabet. Uh, but uh, in English, J kind of came in with a different type of sound for the letter I. So uh, the letter I used to be more for the Y sound, but we don't like that. So we then kind of changed it to a J. So we have, instead of, uh, uh, instead of Jesus, we have Jesus. Because it sounds a little bit better in English. But uh, yeah, so with Joshua, basically what we do is we get, we change the Y to a J, we get rid of this little vowel here, so we have of Josh Lua, I mean simplify it. But his name is Joshua, which is Yehoshua. But this is building on the same word here to say. Now this, this part is actually important. Even though it's dropped in, in English for Joshua, it's actually important because this is shorthand for the name of God. Yahweh, yeah. which often gets uh, transliterated as Yehovah because people didn't know how to read Hebrew for quite some time and they didn't know that there was a very different pronunciation. But uh, Yahweh, usually if you see it abbreviated, you have just this, the Yah part. And you find this with so many different people, um, say like Elijah, Elisha. Uh, the light, the light jaw there. Uh, so keep in mind, J would be Y. Uh, basically, Elijah is basically saying, um, "He is my God," or, or "The Lord is my God." I should say, uh, "The Lord is my God." That's Elijah's name. So this is here. So basically, uh, Joshua means Lord. Or the Lord, I should say. Let's get that. Lord saves, or the Lord is my salvation. My savior. Um, that would be a different form. Oops. What am I doing there? <laughs> Anyways, um, that would be a different form of the of the of the root, unfortunately. <laughs> so not quite. So uh, when they're calling out uh, to Jesus uh, with with Psalm 118 in mind, they're saying, "Save us," because that's what's going on in that verse. In that uh, verse, there they're saying, "Save us unto unto the Lord, Yahweh," and they're speaking directly to Jesus, who <laughs> is Yahweh, who is their salvation. That's what I find to be fun. Um, there's also some extra stuff in there because um, some of the words that are actually being omitted. And I think this is in Psalm 18. No, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, this is in um, Zechariah 9 9. So they, they're quoting Psalm 18 here. In verse 15 in John chapter uh, 12, they're actually quoting Zechariah 9 9. And John is actually omitting uh, half a verse. And in that verse, uh, they're they're saying, um, so there's, O daughter of Zion, see your king coming, see your king coming to save you. Uh, that's also the same thing, but in the default form. I can't conjugate default of Yeshua in my head. The opponent will be off, but I'll go. Oh, 
Oh, wait. Yeah, it's a bicycle. Okay. I can't remember the valve point. I can't remember the specific valve point. But anyways, you have that. Um, and this is uh, bring save us because I think it also has there or or be salvation for us or bring about salvation. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's it. Bring salvation. Bring salvation. Bring salvation or add salvation comp. So that's in the Zechariah verse. So John is kind of bringing this all together, but he's not mentioning all of it. Thanks, John. But it's fun that uh, you, you get to see that the people are calling out with the psalm for salvation to Jesus, who is the Lord, who is our salvation. And he's riding on the donkey to, to, to actually bring salvation. So in Handel's Messiah, when we sing uh, Hosanna in the highest, I always thought that was like a praise. Um, so it's a sort. Um, so, well, we have that also in the in our services. And this is uh, coming in with the sanctus. Um, uh, so pretty much, I think it's pretty much every single divine service that we have has some version of it. Um, so it's, uh, we look to holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of power, might have been of your glory. That's in reference to Isaiah chapter 6. So that's the song of the seraphim that they're singing in heaven. So recognizing the greatness of God. And then immediately we're shifting into Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Which is refer directly referencing the triumphal entry. Um, so when we're talking about Hosanna in the highest, it's actually a plea to God most high for our salvation. Um, with the sanctus, I, I find this very interesting because we're looking at we're looking at the heavenly host praising God in, in heaven and saying how glorious he is. And basically we're in the second part we're going, and he's coming down in as Jesus Christ, and we're asking him to save us here. So we recognize all his greatness and power, and we're also calling upon him for our salvation. Well, yeah, the, the handles Messiah would have that too, but uh, Hosanna in the highest, um, quoting Matthew 21. It's looking to God as the one in the highest who is coming to save us. So has <clears throat> yes, the word changed or taken on a new meaning to a certain degree? I mean, we do use Hosanna as a, a word of praise. Many... That's not what it's supposed to be. <laughs> well, can it not be kind of all inclusive? <clears throat> like words change over centuries from use. And this is why context is king, because in what context are we actually using this? Because if we're looking in the scriptural passage, it will always be a plea for our salvation. So we're recognizing God as the one who's saving us, but the people here at this time with the mindset of Hey, we need salvation from the evil powers of this world. It's always going to be a plea for our salvation. Um, even, even with uh, the sanctus, it is because the sanctus, what, what's going on is it is in between uh, how we begin the service of the sacrament and when we actually begin um, the words of institution where Christ makes himself present through his word. So basically what we're doing is we're asking God to be present within the bread and the wine for our salvation in this meal. So it is a sacrifice of praise in so far as we know God will be true to his word and we recognize all his blessings for us. But in light of these blessings, we're still asking God to save us. So uh, to to kind of give you a parallel, that would be like if 
if you're meeting somebody from a foreign country and um, they don't know exactly what to do or what, what's going on, and then you try to help them out by um, uh, directing them to information centers, et cetera, et cetera. And then they go, oh yeah, so they're, they're imploring you to help them and they're saying, help me, help me. So you help them, you give, send them to information centers and whatnot. And then it'd be like, if they turn to you and go like, oh, help me, help me. And, and you go like, what are, I already helped you. What are you talking about? But they're using that as a term of praise. So that's very confusing with that language. So yeah, um, context is useful, but yeah, you also should have an understanding of the underlying word. But in the foreign language, you tend to accidentally shift your meaning based on how you understand the surrounding context. So Hosanna, when we're saying Hosanna, it's we're we're asking that he come to save us, but at the same time acknowledging that he has. Yeah. So basically, yes, and, and that's one of the beauties of the Lord's Supper is where we're finding it here. But that's how I'm, I'm contextualizing this here. So with the Lord's Supper, in light of him offering salvation to us and already saving us at the cross, we want him to save us in this meal. So we're invoking him, please save us in this meal. And he does again by delivering us from sin, death, and the devil. I'll think of it differently from now on when I say that. <laughs> well, I think oh, maybe yeah. it, it could be that it, it's just a misunderstanding that people did not know the the meaning. It sounds like a song of praise or or just word of praise. So it's very good that we are learning the real meaning. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's not as though like anybody who's not fully understanding the word. It's not as though they're going against God or anything. Like this is just how they understand it within the context as, as they understand context. It's just that we have definitions for words for a reason, and the definitions have to help mold uh, the context. This is what's known as the hermeneutical cycle. Um, so I'll, I'll very quickly... I'll very quickly uh, kind of go through it. So you have you have individual words, and you know, and well, hopefully you know what those words mean. So you have the individual word. I, let's just do a with word, and then you have say a sentence. Then you have the passage. Then you have the entirety of the text, the whole everything all together. And what we do in any language, actually I should even put in here context because context is where this where this work is situated in space and time. But every single time that we try to understand um, what somebody is trying to communicate, I should, it's a double relation. Uh, we're actually trying to understand individual words within the sentence, within the passage, within the context, within the context, and then the word is also influencing everything else. Same thing with the sentence. You have an idea of what that sentence should be, and it's influencing everything else. Um, so this ends up being incredibly complicated when you actually try to think, hey, how do I understand what people mean? Because you don't realize a lot of the background material that you actually need for this. So for a lot of us, uh, say with um, say with the service with the sanctus and, and how people would maybe think of it more as praise than a plea for, for salvation. Well, they're using the context, like the surrounding context that, well, I'm saved in Christ. I, I know that Christ has saved me. Uh, therefore, I'm going to this worship knowing that Christ is saving. That would be the context. Then you have the actual text and a lot of the surrounding text, like the entirety of the service is about how you have received salvation in Jesus Christ and he is enabling you to go out to the world and serve him. Then you have kind of the more 
the localized part of it with the service of the sacrament, and then you're looking at the um, uh, actual bread and wine itself and every all the little bits there, and you're still thinking, well, I'm going to be receiving salvation here. And you might actually be happy about that. So maybe you do think of it as praise, but in that context, you're like, no, well, I'm actually receiving something. So you might get a little bit of a mixed message there. And the actual um, sanctus itself, like you're going, uh, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And yeah, if you don't have enough understanding of the underlying meaning of the word, you're going, yeah, well, I'm just praising God for coming to me. But if you go down to the nitty gritty definition of the word, that will have that will reverse half of what you think, and then you go back to the sentence, you go back to the passage, and you might understand it differently. But yeah, you were you were quite unconsciously were using this part here to determine what that word meant because you didn't know what that you didn't necessarily know exactly what the word meant. So. Language is complicated. Very. <laughs> yes. I didn't even get into communication theory where you have, where you're basically trying to, <laughs> communication theory is basically where you have mind A, mind B, and then you have to try and communicate through this in order to get to there. Because mind, mind B might have an underlying meaning, so he's so mind B is trying to go, hey, this is how I understand this meaning in this language, and then mind A has to decode that, and then go like, well, I associate all these terms with completely different things, so then mind A might have a completely different understanding of what mind B is trying to communicate. Well, when I sing Hosanna in the highest, I'm still going to be thinking about <laughs> praising, <laughs> that I'm praising. <laughs> No, so I mean it's not wrong to think of it as praise, but it's incomplete. Yeah. Because we praise, but we're also requesting at the same time. Yeah. And and and, and that's basically because of the context of the service, because well, when you're in the service, you're giving a sacrifice of praise unto God. Part of that service is where you're doing the sacrifice of praise. Part of that service is praying unto him, save me. But yeah, it's still part of the entirety of the service, which is your praise and God giving you salvation. So you're focusing on the praise a little bit more than the uh, uh, the reception of the salvation at that time. And, and that's basically the only difference. I guess we oftentimes don't feel we need to ask for him to come and save us because... He has. Yeah. I, I would actually push back a little. Because then, then why would you need to suffer? Because he's already sick. And, and that's kind of the beauty of the suffer is that it's a continuous salvation, which is why we uh, pluck out that uh, triumphal entry passage and put it right there because we're asking for him to continue coming to us and, and saving us. Yeah, sometimes I feel like I'm repetitious about asking for the same thing over and over. You know? And Jesus said to that as often as that I know I have as often as then I have to, like do it often. Okay? I have to think again. <laughs> yeah. And that's it's it's one of the weird things for us because at, at the beginning of this morning I was talking about the weirdness of Jesus offering his body and blood to the disciples before he was crucified and his body and blood were offered up. Um, for us, like it's still a very weird thing to do in time, because for us, when we're asking for salvation or, or forgiveness or whatever it is, like it, for us, it's always a point in time, or, or at least for perceiving it's a point in time. Whereas God, through the Holy Spirit, is continuously giving us and moving us in the Spirit. For the forgiveness and reception of grace. So it yeah, there's different concepts of time at play here and it 
for me as a philosopher, I love this, but I know that some people, their heads will spin. Are the more I read our daily devotions, the more I realize how important um, receiving communion is. It's, it seems to be a theme that is constant. And I, I mm -hmm. think about the days gone by where we only had communion once a month. Like, I'm glad we progressed to where we have it every week. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah, we don't, yeah, we don't want to become complacent with it. And we also don't want to just reserve it only for certain days. It's, yeah, it's kind of a balancing act, I, I think, but it is incredibly important for worship life, I would say, if, if we recognize it properly. So. I wanted to remark that uh, in Germany, uh, in the, what they call the Evangelical Protestant Church, uh, emphasis is not often made on Lutheran, but Protestant mm -hmm. Church, so it's a little different, but I remember a Holy Communion often only was around Christmas time, a couple of mm -hmm. times. Uh, Easter, definitely a few times. And then a couple of times in the summer, like harvest time, and then mm -hmm. so on. It was not uh, performed every week, every mm -hmm. Sunday. Yeah. But I really noticed when I came over here, you know, so. Mm. Uh, Do you remember some of the reasons people gave for that, or? Uh, no, because okay. it was just special. It was meant mm. to be special, you know. And, oh, okay. But then again, we, uh, we have a need to repent and to mm. be forgiven on a regular mm. basis, right? So I thought the way it was practiced here more often uh, made more sense to me. You know? yeah. so I think what, the way I was raised too, it was maybe every three months, seems to me, but I was in a country community too where you know, it was a different situation. Yeah. And people, I'll never forget as a child, uh, people would leave money on a collection plate after they received communion. It was a, like sitting at the front page or there, where we put in, well, I, I think in those days it was probably a dime or maybe a quarter of most mm -hmm. people would put in, apart from the regular collection, but just from receiving mm -hmm. communion, and they would never heard of that. I don't know if that was the pay for the wine. I don't know. <laughs> oh, you, usually the idea is you would have the offering before the sacrament, and then you're like, this is what I'm paying uh, yeah. in, in part to receive the sacrament. It's make sure that there is very much. That's interesting. Yeah, as a child, I never did learn why. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's also um, some mentions in some of the early church fathers about uh, communion practices. So some of the church fathers, and keep in mind, these were also uh, priests, most of them were priests, anyway, uh, that they're saying things like, oh, uh, I receive communion three, four times a week, and, blah, 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 blah. and these are the days that I usually do it, and I can't make it to every day that it's offered. And blah, blah. But yeah, it, it was very much encouraged very early on to have communion very often. So the Roman Catholic Church still tries to do this, uh, preserve that, and basically offering Mass. Every day. Usually every day. I'm not really aware of certain parishes that wouldn't or at least wouldn't offer it if, if somebody were to. Anyway, so I think people have closed up. <laughs> uh, I think it's time to pray. <laughs> yeah. I want to thank you for the prayers. I mean, we had a bad week last week and oh. I'm sure the prayers were seeing me through it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for giving us your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, that he may 
come into our world and cleanse us from evil and sin and all the guilt that lays within our hearts. We ask you, O Lord, that we may join regularly in this forgiveness and this grace. We ask you also to preserve your church here on earth, that we may also regularly participate it, uh, in it with uh, Holy Communion. Uh, we ask you, O Lord, in addition to our spirits, to also uphold us in the flesh. Uh, we pray for your servant, Adele, that you continue uh, healing her, uh, guiding her, and working with her physicians and doctors and everybody else looking after her health, that she might be brought into greater security of the flesh. All this we pray for in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.